So welcome back, Ezra, and we welcome all the attended participants again. This is session six of International Road Safety Dialogues, organized by ICORSI. And we invite Professor Ezra Howard to make uh, this presentation on road safety research and practice. Ezra, all yours. Thank you, Gita. How many attendees do you have there? Oh, we've had, um, at present, we have 78. And uh, otherwise, <coughs> five minutes back, there were 83. OK, guys. Um, <clears throat> Okay, invisible audience. <laughs> uh, when I was a young researcher, <clears throat> many, many years ago, I thought that the relationship with the research and practice is a fairly straightforward one. At least that it looked to me, I do my work my research work, if it's any good, then it will eventually go into practice. I didn't really worry about how it will get into practice. Uh, I, I was kind of research focused. To me, doing research was interesting and important. And uh, I just allowed myself to believe that it will be influential. So, while I, I, I understood that research and practice are separate things, like two separate silos, people in one don't necessarily uh, work in the same environment as people in the other silo, but that the two silos are quite closely connected. I didn't worry about that connection. And to the extent that the invisible audience is made up of many young researchers, <clears throat> maybe it looks the same way to you. So I'm going to share with you uh, uh, the jaundiced eye of a more mature or older person. The world doesn't seem to be so perfect to me. <clears throat> and while there are these two silos, they are connected, but perhaps just very loosely somewhere invisible to me. And so I started asking myself questions such as those on the slide. How, how does it work? How does it? How does research go into practice? Does it? To what extent? And there is certainly in the last two, three decades, lots of road safety research published. And I'm asking myself, is it usable? And how much of it actually gets to be used in some shape or form or form? Uh, I don't know where you would put your marker in this left to right, right to left scale, whether lots of research is being used, whether little research is being used. My marker would come somewhere around the minus two, minus three mark, perhaps. Uh, I don't know what, what you would say. Well, the question is, if the world is not perfect, then it isn't. What exactly are the imperfections? And then, of course, the, the subsequent question, what do we do about it? <coughs> well, <coughs> from my rocking chair, I can really only tell stories and then raise some questions. That's really a, a weak... Uh, weak kind of argument because, and I'm being told by those who don't agree with me that my stories are not representative. Uh, and if they are representative, then they are certainly representative only of North America, which is where my experience is and perhaps not, 
not representative of your experience. So I only can defer to you and say, listen to the stories and then decide to what extent these imperfections are important and need to be corrected. <clears throat> Allow me to sip my tea while I speak because this is now the second hour. Sure. Yes, yes, sure. <coughs> Thank you. The, this story is not really a very earth shaking one. The, its only merit is that it's now on my mind. And it will serve like, a, like an end bookmark for the present, so from here on, I will go back into, in, into the past. I, I wrote a paper about the, the ease and safety of pedestrians crossing mid block between traffic signals, between coordinated traffic signals. You may not know, but most pedestrians are not killed at intersections, most are are, are killed mid-block. And the paper is really, I will not go either into this time distance, the explaining the time distance this diagram. Those who know are familiar with it, don't know, don't know <clears throat> it would take too long to explain. But signals when they are being coordinated, the two main parameters are the offset, which is the time difference between when the green begins at the downstream intersection and when it begins at the upstream intersection, and the cycle time. How long does it take to go to the red, green, amber phases? Uh, is it every 60 seconds or every 90 or every 120 or in some congested areas even longer? The belief is that, that uh, these uh, two parameters affect intersection safety. Before I send the papers to be refereed formally, I send it always to a number of colleagues uh, for comments so that I can improve it before before it goes into refereeing. Here I sent it to a fairly, fairly large number of very experienced traffic engineers. And they all came back to me saying, Ezra, this is not a good idea. Not a good idea because if you start fiddling with the offset and the cycle time in the interest of pedestrians, you are bound to make intersection safety worse. So I said to them, now, why do you think so? And all five of them said, we believe that to be true. But what is your belief based on? Well, we don't know. This is the, this is what the, our culture is. So I thought perhaps I should find out what their belief is based on. So I looked at the signal timing manual, the Bible for signal timing, there's nothing in it about the safety effect of offset, safety effect of cycle time, nothing. I looked into the highway safety manual, <coughs> nothing. It has a section on signal timing, but it doesn't say about how offset and cycle time affect the safety of, uh, at intersections. I looked into the crash modification cleaning house maintained by the Federal Highway Admin Administration. I found one paper, not about the effect of offset and cycle time, but about signal coordination. It led me to some other papers, uh, not very good ones, not convincing, 
contradictory findings. One says it's better to bring the platoon in at the beginning of green, end of green. The upshot of all this is that experienced traffic engineers must rely on belief because the evidence is not there. Now, I don't want to open this Pandora's box. I, I wrote about the effect about engineering judgment separate. But here I can raise some questions. <coughs> so we know that coordination, signal coordination affects safety. And there must be hundreds of thousands of coordinated signals in our cities. And we have been coordinating signals also from time immemorial, but sophisticated coordination since mid 1960s. So 60 years later, we, we believe that coordination affects safety, but we don't know how. How come? This is a question of research and practice. And, and who is supposed to find out? I mean, finding out is not a trivial matter. It, it takes planning, it takes money, it takes research team. Somebody has to take the initiative. Who is supposed to do that? And if we have these disparate small efforts, why, why don't they show the same thing? Why are the findings contradictory and easy to question. And perhaps even at the most fundamental level, safety and mobility do not usually go hand in hand. What might be good for minimizing stops and delay may not be good for road safety. And can we, traffic engineers, I don't know what your profession is, but I kind of identify with traffic engineers. Can we take, take on this responsibility of balancing mobility and safety? Can we kind of by education and culture do it? Can society rely on us doing it. I said earlier, you will have to form an opinion about how representative and applicable are my observations. So here you would have to ask, is the story that I have been telling you about gaps, uh, is it a one-off or is it kind of commonly found? That I think is your responsibility to try and ask yourself. <clears throat> now I will go back in time to 1986, which is I think about when I started asking myself questions of this kind. I was working at that time as part of a team developing the special transportation research rep report 214 design the subject was how to design safer world, safer roads. <clears throat> the project had money and we commissioned special studies by, by co uh, consultants asking questions about what is known, what is known about the safety effect of lane widths, what is known about the safety effect of horizontal curves, 
how do narrow bridges affect the safety of rural roads? And questions of this, this kind. We, we received six or seven reports of that kind. And that was really strange because all of them came back sounding an uncertain trumpet saying, we don't really know, we need more research. Here is what is being said, but this is contradicted by somebody else. And a picture of unclarity. I think this is my, perhaps what motivated me into raising subsequently questions of this kind. So it was 1986, modern road building in, in the US since World War II, let's say 1945, 40 years of experience, lots of miles of roads designed, built, used, and we still don't know. <clears throat> and, and the kinds of things that emerged from this was that opinion and judgment is frequently sufficient for taking decisions that affect road user safety. We just I asked, as I asked before, the research is not really organized. It's not something like we don't know X, therefore we will constitute a committee and fund the project and 10 years later, we will know. There is no such thing as organized research. And reading the literature, it seems oh, very frequently that are, the conclusions are not independent, that somebody was interested in one conclusion rather than another. And this resulted in a body of knowledge which when you, just like on the internet today, you cannot really know what's true and what's not true. <clears throat> so my experiences is like what Churchill refers to, it's one bam thing after another. And I will tell you <clears throat> several more stories as long as my la time will allow. I'm taking off my watch just to know where I stand. <clears throat> I, will, I will just say a few sentences of the stories in the lower tier and then going to the stories in the upper tier in some more detail. So at the <clears throat> low left end, you have a two lane road. And the question is lane width. What do we know about the effect of lane width? There was lots of research done. All of the early research seemed to have indicated that 11 foot, 3.3 meter, lanes are safer than 12 foot lanes. Then the Transportation Research Board, it was still in the distant past, commissioned a, a consultant to do a study. And he too found out 11 foot lanes are safer than 12 foot lanes, but by that time, and throughout history, there was what we call today Green Book, but at that time was the Blue Book, the policy on the geometric design of roads and streets and highways. And subsequent editions of the policy all said that 12 foot lanes are desired. What can the consultant do? He says 11 foot lanes are safest. The policy says 12 foot lanes. <clears throat> well, the consultant fiddled with the numbers, creatively merged one column in another to show that the 11 foot lanes are just the safest 12 foot lanes. That's back in 1980 or so. 
20 years later, I work on a study for the interactive highway safety design. There are four or five of us around the table. We have to come up with a recommendation for this model. The majority says, let's not shake the boat. Let's say 11 and 12 foot lanes are the same safety. Contrary to the fact, go to the Highway Safety Manual 2010. What does it show? 11 and 12 foot safe, lanes equally safe. So you have some pollution of the, of the knowledge base, some dependence of research on policy, some problem. Look at the next graphic. You have raised pavement markers. Research shows that putting raised pavement markers on curves is not good for safety. After research shows, comes to this conclusion, the Federal Highway Administration gives an award to a state or to a state for putting raised pavement markers on curves. And three states declare that they will go with the judgment rather than with finding the findings of research. And the next, next uh, graphic shows you a four-way stop controlled intersection. Four-way stop controlled intersections have about half the crashes than two-way stop controlled intersections. But the manual on uniform traffic control devices, which is the national standard in the US, recommends, says only that four-way stops are effective under certain conditions. Contrary to what research finds, they are effective on all under all conditions, and so on and so forth. So wherever I scratch the surface, I come up against important problems of the practice to research relationship. And so <clears throat> let me go into some more detail with a few more stories. <clears throat> this is an, also a MUTCD story. If you look at the picture on the left, just behind that signal is a supermarket. I used to take my bike and go to that supermarket to buy a carton of milk. We live uh, about a 10 minute ride from that supermarket. And having used that bike lane, I find it really uncomfortable or, or I feel Kavi? I don't know what happened. Um, we seem to, he seems to be online, but we don't. Okay, and I think we are okay now, right? Uh, uh, we don't see your screen. Uh, we maybe we share your screen again, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, you. I think you have to, yeah, share your screen again. You can come on. Let's try. <clears throat> can you see the screen now? Yeah, yeah it's coming. Yes. It's, it's there. Okay. Now. I'll, I'll uh, go to the right slide. I think slide number eight. 
Okay, I will have to move forward, but it's not a problem. Let me just. Uh... Yes, sure. Okay. Perfect. Are we back, back in business? Yes. Okay. So as you see, every right turning car has to cross my path and it made me feel unsafe. I started, you know, put, put my fingers on the handlebar on the brakes whenever I came close to the intersection. So I asked myself, where does this intersection design come from? Well, it's part of the manual of uniform traffic control devices as shown on the right. <clears throat> and it has been in the manual since about 1980. Uh, so I could not find any reference about the safety of this, any, anything in the literature about the safety of this design. So I asked all my bicycle safety expert friends, and they did not know anything about the safety of this design either. And because it looked so frightening to me, I wrote to the person at the MUTCD uh, and asking about the safety of this design. And the answer was, that it got into the into the MUTCD because it looked like a sensible solution, but nobody followed up. There is no way of really finding out whether it's safe or not safe. It's not like with, with cars, when there is a malfunctioning part, the manufacturer knows who owns such cars and they can be uh, can be called back and repaired, that nobody really did any work on the safety of this design, which on the face of it doesn't look very safe to me. So I asked, how do they, <clears throat> how do things get into the MUTCD? It's not like, with a drug, you know, you have to prove that it's useful, that it's beneficial and doesn't do any harm. <clears throat> and today we are <clears throat> in the midst of an epidemic, but we are waiting for answers to this question, these kinds of questions. And when the Ebola was raging and people were dying left, right and center and still one waited, for the drug to be approved, things go in, get into the MUTCD on the basis of, of opinion and stay there uh, till somebody complains or, the, or does a study, but nobody initiates these studies. Uh, the, the, I think this is a general question. I mean, we are getting binding guidelines and we are not clear about the evidence required for such guidelines to become clear, to become binding. Now, I don't know how general it is. I, I do, for the MUTCD, I by now have two or three such instances where things got into it and perhaps should not be there. <clears throat> Here's another such MUTCD story, another in Churchill's words, them story from my own experience. It has to do with pedestrian countdown signals. These were introduced into, in Toronto several years ago. I, it must be at least five, but perhaps more. And there was a study done an academic study, again, perhaps symptomatic, that the follow-up is not done as a matter of course by an agency that 
is responsible for doing it, but it was done by, in this case, by a healthcare unit in a, in a hospital and done by econometric means. And the conclusion seems to have been that these pedestrian countdown signals do more harm than good for pedestrians. And it got quite a bit of newspaper coverage. So it aroused my curiosity. It aroused my curiosity. And I asked, why did the MUTCD made it into a requirement? It is now a requirement. All new signal installations in North America, in, in uh, the US, they meet certain criteria of size have to have countdown signals. So how did it get into that, in, to be a, a requirement? Well, again, I wrote to the chair, in this case, chair of the technical committee uh, of the MUTCD, and he referred me to the Federal Register. The Federal Register is an official organ of the US government, which publishes all all, uh, all planned rules and regulations so that people can, or uh, interested parties can comment. And after a certain time, the docket is important. After a certain time, uh, um, it becomes rule. So in the Federal Register, the Federal Highway Administration asks the MUTCD, which it is responsible for, to change countdown signals from being an option to be a requirement. This is in 2009. And the justification given in the Federal, Federal Register is that a multi-year project involving hundreds of locations showed significant safety benefits. And this is one project. They give the reference. It's a paper published in, in the IT journal in 2006. So being a stubborn person, I read the paper. <clears throat> Here is what the paper found. This is from San Francisco, written by a conscientious local traffic engineer and his co co-workers. They treated seven intersections where more, two or more injury crashes were related. That is, they put count on signals at seven intersections, actually at nine, but two, not, two did not get into the study. And really, these intersections had 26 crashes before the, sig the countdown signals were introduced and only 11 crashes after the countdown signals were introduced. But they had 185 intersections, which also had two or more crashes, injury crashes but they did not yet install the pedestrian countdown signals. And their two crashes went down significantly from 507 to 282. So going back to what the FHWA is said in the Federal Register, to their eternal shame, the, there were not hundreds of locations. Hundreds of locations were left untreated. There were only seven treated locations. And it is true that the treated locations, the crashes went down, a big reduction. But the untreated loca locations, the crashes went down equally. So, without treatment, just the same way. Any 
high school student seeing these numbers would say there was no effect. But the FHWA said significant effect. Now, the traffic engineer, Markovitz and R and his co-workers, they recognized that this is just a regression to the mean. But the MUTCD and the FHWA did not recognize that this is a regression to the mean. Ezra, yes. so I would uh, like to pose a question here because uh, listening to these um, processes that you have described, uh, you know, actually it brings out very many uh, experiences that I've had in um, working in India. And uh, our, uh, we have Indian Roads Congress, which puts together standards and uh, road design standards uh, for all kinds of things, geometric standards, safety standards, etc., And the process is very much the same. In fact, the process that you have described uh, started in 86. I think in 2020, we are still following the same process. My question is, so you quote Federal Register for changing their justification. And then you said the quotation is a multi-year project, hundreds of locations which actually is, in very simple words, a lie. It's untrue statement of what you have shown later. Now, I know that in US and in TRB, we have seen there are committees and subcommittees which are debating each of these aspects. And I have seen that uh, not only the papers which are being presented, but even the technical reports are supposed to be peer reviewed. So if all these processes are there, how are we losing this? Uh, you know, in, in academic journals also, we follow uh, a peer review process, which we are following in these technical reports also. So where are we losing this uh, sense of getting the right reviews and uh, rechecking what we are saying? And actually, why is it not that we are uh, recalling some of these things because it's based on not, um, you know, not just weak uh, result, but untrue. The statement itself is a lie. So do we not have processes to challenge these things? Well, your question, Gitam, is at the core of my presentation. I'm, I, basically, I'm saying that there are major problems here, that the relationship between research and practice has major problems. Not only research, has, not only practice has research problems, research has major problems. The, the entire system does not seem, in my opinion, to work as the road users deserve it should work. Uh, peer review, is a good thing, but it's not a perfect thing. And you and I know that a peer review, let's say, for accident analysis and prevention is very different from the peer review for the TRB, for the road research record. The, the road research record has to be reviewed within weeks, within few weeks, thousands of papers by people who are not always qualified to do so. So just saying it has been peer reviewed is no guarantee of quality. You have to know what kind of peer review and who, who the peer reviewers are. And so. But th this is just an aside that there are systematic issues. And this is what I'm trying to point out. Mm -hmm. In this case, when you look at the composition of the technical committee of the MUTCD, there are very few people, very few researchers who, and perhaps the people on that committee just don't know about the regression to mean effect. 
I'm quite sure that the people in the FHWA know about regression to mean. Why did they not recognize it? I don't know. What was the rush? Was the rush because the equipment came into being or because somebody thought it's a good idea? I don't know. There, there are no safeguards, not in terms of process, not in terms of people who are on these committees. And number three, I say, I ask, should there be no procedure that there are there is sufficient evidence of benefits and no harm? I think, yes, there should be, but there isn't. Mm. <clears throat> well, I see that I have only about 10 minutes to the end of this, uh, end of our session. Uh, we can go for 15 minutes if you wish. Sorry? We can go for 15 minutes. Okay, I will, I will see how far I get. I have here a, a long story, multi-chapter story, but I don't think I will get to the end of it. Those of you who are interested, can read it in the paper. I will give the, refer the reference to the paper in the last slide. <clears throat> so here is chapter one. And I'm now speaking about edge lining. The, the photograph is about an edge lining machine there. So this is the subject. <clears throat> Edge lining started in, in the US around 1954. <coughs> Excuse me. It was done in a few states. There was kind of anecdotal evidence that it's a good thing to do. And it was really very consistent with our culture, engineering culture, that believed that better side distances, seeing the edge of the road better must be good for safety. <clears throat> and so it's what was judged to be a promising countermeasure. And on the basis of this judgment, Kansas and Ohio started a systematic program of edge line. 1957. And then <clears throat> two years later, they began a randomized control trial in each state. In Ohio, I think they selected something like nine pairs of roads and randomly decided which to edge line and which not to edge line. In Kansas, I think they had 12 pairs of very similar roads. And again, randomly decided to get one, to edge line one of the pairs. And three years later, they reported on the results in what is the predecessor of the transportation research record, the highway research bulletin. <coughs> Now, without looking at the results, there are some questions that arise. What really were these randomized control trial for? It's of course very desirable to do RCTs. It's perhaps a show of diligence, but the decision to, to edge line roads has been taken already in this case, four years earlier, five years before the report, the results were known. And it could not have been thought that the decision will now be, if, if the results are not good to stop edge lining, it, it's difficult to think that that was a reasonable option. Uh, I don't really have an answer to the question of why the RCTs were conducted. I tried to find the 
actors, but regrettably found only obituaries now. So I could not ask. Uh, <clears throat> It is perhaps that the research function in these state highway agencies is a kind of decoration. You have a group of people, like here you have a picture of Madame de Pompadour, the courtesan uh, to Louis XV. You know, she is there, she is used when needed. Her opinions can be listened to, but can be safely disregarded. The same with your research unit. Maybe it's there just for decoration or occasional opinion, but not really influencing policy. Varkin asked more generally, what is the role of evaluation research in operating agencies? Uh, because there is clearly this, this to enforce between formation of policy and evidence. How does it work? I mean, it would have been reasonable to do the RCTs before the decision was to, to age line was taken and, and initiate the programs initiated. But evaluating afterwards maybe is good form. Maybe it is good propaganda if you get good results. But other than that, I'm not sure what the function is. So here, what I note is that opinion was sufficient to begin on costly and permanent programs. This is kind of from now till eternity. You shall edge line roads and keep them in good repair. And again, experience was gained, and at least till the RCTs. There was no research to tell us it is useful or not useful. When the results came in, <clears throat> they were surprising. And the surprise is em embedded in these two tables. Uh, it, it, intersections and access points, there were many fewer crashes, 63% fewer in Ohio, 46% fewer uh, in Kansas. But between access points and intersections, the number of accidents actually increased 15 to, 20, to 27%. Now, these were small studies, but not negligible studies, as you see from the total crashes involved. So crashes diminished at access points, which is where there is no H1. How come? And crashes increased between access points where you placed the egg edge lines, how come? These are the surprises. The authors did offer some speculative speculation. I'm not sure that we need to go into it, but it, it's quite of interesting. If you want the papers, I'll be happy to, to email them to you. They are interesting papers. But now what? So you are running the program, you are busy edge line roads, and it seems that this is no good. Or at least it's good when it's supposed not to work and bad when it's supposed to work. <clears throat> well, you can ask yourself what should have been done and, and in, in this perfect world, the program should have been stopped and a larger research initiated, and based on the, risk, the outcome of the larger research, uh, conclusions drawn and changes made. But nothing happened. The program just continued. The, 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 the results were... I cannot not find any trace of the effect of the results. 
So maybe my young researcher picture is really kind of naive. The work, work, work doesn't work that way. Just doing research is not enough. <clears throat> perhaps image is better, perhaps uh, Dreze's image is better. Uh, those in the audience who are from India know that Dreze is a world-renowned economist. In one of his writings, I found this sentence saying, that evidence is about facts, but policy is a political issue. And there is a long be bridge between the two. Perhaps this bridge image is a better image for our purposes. That evidence is evidence, but then en road to policy, there must be judgment, there must be other considerations, which the evidence producing community cannot furnish, cannot provide, should not provide. <clears throat> the chapter three of that long saga about edge lining is that if you read the abstract of the papers and if you read the conclusions of the papers, they are frankly misleading. They say that edge lining made for a significant reduction in crashes. Of course, if you lump at, at, at intersection and non-intersection together, then you will get some reduction. But if you separate the two into intersection and non-intersection, you end up with your old puzzle that it's working where it should not work and not working where it should. And so <clears throat> if you remember nothing from this presentation, then remember the name Upton Sinclair, who said it is very difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. And, and our question is, can one get, get evidence from researchers that depend in their livelihood on the results of the research? That is, can one have a safety effect evaluation function within an operating agency or done by people who depend on the goodwill of the operating agents. <clears throat> Are we getting evidence-based practice or practice-based evidence? Now, this is the time when, when Cinderella has to go home and the coach turns into pumpkin, right? This is the time when I should stop, but I will add. No, 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 I don't have too many questions right now. So if you want, you can continue for another five, ten, five minutes. Let me continue for a few, few slides and then we'll go into yes. the question. Yes. Okay. I will not go into detail here just so that I come to the conclusion. So I think that this bridge image would work well when evidence is really separate from judgment and considerations. But I'm quite sure it cannot work well when those in charge of the evidence also apply their political and other judgment to, to what they produce as evidence. That is for research to be useful, it has to be independent. And I will not cover the rest of the saga, which is really interesting. You can read it in the paper, uh, but it basically co continues with the same, same messaging. So when in Kansas and and uh, in Ohio, the mission was to show that edge lining saves lives. That's what entered into the body of knowledge, misleadingly. When the FHWA had to spend $400 million edge lining roads, 
and telling Congress whether it was effective, well, predictably, they said it was effective on the basis of studies that would be laughed out of a first course on project evaluation. It's simply embarrassing work. <clears throat> when the mission was in the 2000s already, around 2010, to justify putting into the MUTCD a minimum retroreflectivity standard, the FHWA again commissioned reports distorting evidence, producing incorrect results. And it all goes into polluting the knowledge base. And once your knowledge base is polluted, your practice is not, cannot be evidence-based. And so this is the before last slide. And I'm stating my prejudice, being on the side of the road user, that we all have a right to life and live in freedom and, and safety. And this is why decisions affecting road user safety should be taken into account by fact-based expectation of consequences. And if they are not, then road user safety is being compromised. <coughs> the issues that I noted <coughs> is the gaps in knowledge remain unfilled. If findings are easy to disregard, that research results are influenced by external interests, that the body of knowledge is polluted, and that the research to practice system is basically unplanned. I think these issues need fixing. You can get a copy of the entire report by asking me for it through ResearchGate. And it's nine now, five minutes after the time. No, no, that's Krishna. perfectly. <coughs> Thank you, Ezra, for covering such an important topic, because uh, this is of interest to researchers and practitioners, and the young researchers and the young practitioners all. So before I take up, but there is a question from one of our uh, panelists, but uh, let me pose this other question to you. I'm sorry, Gitam, I, I lost you. Or you because lost... in this part, you can be. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you, but I didn't hear any of the questions. Okay, I will just. So you highlight the research to be independent, to give useful results. Otherwise, we end up having uh, practice-based evidence. This has strong resonance with medical research, because we know that you know sponsored research has. Uh, led to havoc in public health. And there are several systematic reviews which have found that pharmaceutical industry, particularly <coughs> uh, sponsorships of these industries of drug studies is associated with findings that are favorable to the sponsor's product. And we find similar thing being mentioned by you. So now since traffic safety is a public health problem, do we need similar safeguards as recommended for clinical trials of drugs? And as you know that NIH funding requires a rigorous justification of proposals, objectives, endpoints, et cetera, et cetera, for clinical biomedical finding. And despite all this, we still go through very difficult, sometimes difficult situations. So, so I know in the in the at the end of the your presentation you have listed these set of uh, 
some very difficult problems and we have to fix these and find solutions. But uh, clearly, uh, I mean, what do you think? Is there a similarity between what's happening in medical research, but where we have become much more careful now, as opposed to having similar consequences here, but we still have to develop those quote unquote gold standards. Uh, parallels are informative, but sometimes dangerous. Uh, the, the useful part of the parallel is uh, that medicine being imperfect as, as we know it is, has made major strides towards evidence-based practice precisely because it was careful in the last generation or so to gain genuine evidence through randomized controlled trials and to require conflict of interest statements in publications and so on. But Gitan, there is a major difference between medicine and road safety. Medicine has clients, you and me and everybody else, Uh, and it has no control over the policy and sub and 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 uh, let, let me tackle it from the other end. Road safety is partly determined by the product, by the roads we build and by the way we manage traffic. And who is the producer of roads and who is the manager of traffic? It is the state. State mm -hmm. and its employees. State in all its, uh, all its uh, manifestations being a city or a county or a state or a nation. So we are closer to the pharmaceutical industry in this case, being the pro producer of the stuff that, that, that determines the health outcomes. We are not so much like the medical profession. So when we when we speak about the research to practice relationship, the consumer part is missing. The road user is not part of the equation. And I think this is the fundamental issue. The producer of roads and the producer of traffic control determining the safety outcomes and at the same time creating the knowledge about the safety effects of these outcomes. The absence of separation between the producer of mm -hmm. the system and the evaluator of the system. That yeah. I think is at the core of the problem here. Yeah. In a way, the independence of state or the neutrality of state that we expect is lost in this collusion. Yeah. Uh, we have a question, two questions now. <clears throat> and uh, first question is by Kavi Bhalla. And he's saying, 
uh, we know from ICORC evidence gap map that there is very little evidence on how road characteristics affect crashes in low and middle income countries. And there is little research happening right now in these countries. So in the best case scenario, it will be years before we have evidence, but road building continues. What should policymakers do right now about making guidelines in the absence of local evidence? This is Tavi's question, right? Yes. <clears throat> there are always different, there are obvious differences between between rich and poor countries. I just stated one of the different. Therefore, uh, the difference that there, therefore there must be differences in practice and response between the two kinds of countries. But then there is also a great deal of commonality. People are people everywhere. They went through the same evolutionary processes. Yes. The, the culture may be different, but the vision is the same. The eyes are the same. So one can derive use on the base on this basis, on the basis of the fact that people are similar, that vehicles are similar. One can draw conclusions from the experience of developed countries. So if you want to be specific, Kavi, and ask how wide should be lanes in your design policies, I think you should go and look at the research results in developed countries, identify the biases as I tried to do in my work, come to the core which tells you that people adapt, that on these wider lanes, they drive a bit faster, then that these edge lines especially on curves, they drive, or, or race pavement markers on curves, they drive a bit faster. Uh, say to yourself that, that, that uh, US policy on geometric design or that the German standards on this respect are not really a Bible to follow, but the research findings about how people behave are relevant and come to a conclusion on that basis. And this is where the differences will come, come into play in your, uh, amongst your decision makers, uh, deciding what are our means and how much can we afford. I, I know from my own work that some of these, some of the policies that come from, from developed countries are not safety motivated and some are wasteful. That we have been providing side distances on, on crest curves with very little safety benefit, but having to dig very deep into mountains at great expense. Uh, or that we can derive major benefits <coughs> from, from simple things like, such as replacing two-way stops with, with uh, four-way stops without having to go into the expense of uh, perhaps roundabouts. So I'm sure there are lessons to be learned from what has been done in developed countries. At the same time, if you don't find, want to find yourself, 
now and 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 50 years from now in the same position of having to adapt foreign research to developing countries, then it's time to start now. And it's time to start not by this joint uncoordinated individual uh, studies sponsored by interested agencies. It's time to begin a planned, coordinated research program for developing countries, which they jointly can afford, even if they each singly cannot afford. And not, not to overplay the not invented here uh, syndrome where every small jurisdiction has to verify results of others. Aspirin works roughly the same way all over the globe. <clears throat> Very important because uh, how important it is to look at evidence and what kind of evidence has transferability because human beings are the same. Uh, uh, Ezra, I have one more question here, Victor by Victor Valencia. Do you know if there is a scientific evidence of the effect on road safety of the location of the faces of traffic lights at intersections? And this is not another damn history. <clears throat> Can you please repeat the last part of the uh, It is. It says that, uh, do you know if there is scientific evidence of the effect on road safety of the location of the faces of traffic lights at intersections? Mm -hmm. The last, uh, and this is not another damn history. Well, I, no, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, <clears throat> the only, only useful comment that I can make is uh, that it that the skepticism which seems to be inherent in the wording of the question is a, a very good habit I think uh, there have been claims made about the uh, effect of for example optically programmed, uh, uh, traffic signal systems, which is kind of along the lines of the question, which are complete bogus. Uh, it's re really often difficult to separate the, to identify the interest of some manufacturers from the reported effectiveness. For example, the entire issue of retroreflectivity, which I mentioned that Congress asked the FHWA to implement, was initiated by hearings before Congress by, of an institution, IATSS, I think, has traffic safety in the title but it is really a, a, an organization of paint manufacturers and glass bead manufacturers who came before Congress saying, in the interest of all drivers, you should make sure that retroactivity is maintained. So at the root of all this research that then distorted evidence, was a commercial interest to begin with. I'm not saying that retroactivity is wet for safety, nor I am saying that countdown, countdown traffic signals are wet for safety. I'm just questioning the integrity of the entire process involving mm -hmm. safety and practice. Yes, I think I see one more question. Meanwhile, 
Actually, Professor, uh, yes, there is a question now here. What is your idea about limitations of money, technology, and even specialists to bridging between evidence and policy in some countries which need to be considered? So what is your idea about limitations of money and technology in bridging gap between evidence and policy? Well, I, <coughs> Even I'm not specialists... sure I follow the wording of the question. Uh, I don't know whether I should take it as what is the influence of money in all this gamut of questions with the, between the relationship of, in the relationship between research and policy. Uh, is there some way to clarify the intent of this question? Uh, maybe we can request the uh, participant who's posed this question to write to the website and we will put, because I think we, now we are running short of, we are coming to the end of the session also. Uh, if in next few minutes, perhaps I can request uh, the participant who has written this question to clarify it. Meanwhile, I can take another question quickly. And this is from Krista Hayden. How to avoid that third world countries primarily are interested in activities that they can own themselves, like information enforcement, et cetera. So I'm not sure. Krista is asking how to avoid that third world countries primarily are interested in activities that they can own themselves. Uh, hello, Krista. It's happy. I'm very happy to hear from you. <coughs> uh, I understand that by your experience, third world countries are interested in activities that they can for, perform themselves, which I think is, is of course, natural. And uh, the question only is, what are the activities that they can perform themselves? And so here we come perhaps to the issue of what it is. Can they perform uh, the kind of data collection that exists in developing countries in terms of developing a database on crashes, developing, the, developing appropriate databases for uh, traffic counting and, and, and perhaps developing a, a data set of in-depth accident investigations and then putting all this together in in terms of research. Okay, it's so I, uh, I, I haven't answered Krista's question. <clears throat> I think that, that some of these activities are important. Some of these activities can be uh, relegated to a later time, but it's very, it will be very difficult to embark on an evidence-based uh, practice uh, which it is done within local means without at the same time starting on the process of data collection and independent coordinated research. So now we come to the end of this session and uh, there is a, a, 
Matthew, Dr. Matthew Varghese has written, in medical field, the external influences are far more, especially as public funding of medicine has decreased over the years. And uh, this brings us to a very, very important uh, conclusion and guidance for us, where Ezra, you have talked about the importance of uh, independent research and uh, especially everywhere. I mean, that is not just a problem of low and middle income countries, but also with your illustrations you have shown in high income countries as well. So as public funding reduces, I think we are up for a big challenge. And uh, you have also concluded your uh, presentation as well as your paper with some very difficult questions and issues that one has to solve. And uh, I guess we look forward to our young researchers to look for more stronger bridges and shorter bridges between research and practice. With that, uh, Ezra, I would really like to thank you for giving this really, really interesting and wonderful presentation. And uh, the, both sessions have been recorded. And to the participants, the recordings would be available on ICORC websites. <coughs> Since you're a registered participant, you will get an information. Perhaps on YouTube also, you would have access to these recordings. And thanks again. And uh, I think on Thursday, we have the seventh lecture of this uh, international dialogue. We look forward to meeting all the participants uh, once again. And uh, good night from India and for other places also, goodbye. And we hope to see you coming Thursday, same yes. time. Thank same you, Gitam, and thank the invisible audience. <clears throat> Yes, thank you.